the, the Global Donor Platform has uh, followed the aid effectiveness debate uh, since Paris and was present in, in Accra and, and led the discussion on the agricultural sector uh, in the working group in, in Accra. Uh, since January of this year, uh, we've been planning of how we will participate in Busan and in line with the platform's policy and strategic goals, how we will advocate and support uh, a better representation of agriculture and uh, rural development and poverty alleviation in, in the Busan High Level Forum. We've done that through applying for side events at Busan and also for mini debates. And in Busan, uh, WFP, EFAD and OECD, all groups that are working with the platform, will present a side event on uh, agriculture, nutrition and food, getting the results. And Alina had sent out an email about that on Monday evening. We also have two mini debates. Uh, one sponsored by EFAD on, on scaling up results and another one uh, with the platform. And again, the platform together with the, uh, the Popular Coalition for Food Sovereignty will be hosting a side event looking at, at, at food uh, sovereignty issues and uh, inclusive policy making. Uh, as a background to this, one of the papers that OECD asked us to work on was uh, looking at the evidence of how the agricultural sector has been able to respond to the five principles of the Paris Declaration, country alignment, harmonization, country ownership, results, and mutual accountability. And earlier this year, the platform and its membership, under the guidance and support of, of Michael Wales, uh, put together the evidence paper, which we've uh, brought together this afternoon for, for a discussion, we'll be taking the evidence paper uh, with us to Busan and speaking to those issues. Uh, and this, is, this afternoon, this is an opportunity to go through and <clears throat> get feedback from our uh, uh, members on some of the, the key issues that we want to stress at Busan, and also perhaps have a discussion on some of the issues that we want to see highlighted after Busan and what the platform will do to follow up on the post-Busan agenda. So with those brief words, uh, many thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we'll now hear from Michael and then we'll open up to a Q&A session and then we'll close in about uh, an hour's, 45 minutes to an hour's time. Thank you, Mike. Uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, let's get started then. Uh, the paper itself will, in this presentation, will really cover why it's important to focus on aid effectiveness in agriculture and rural development. Secondly, what challenges there are in each of the five Paris Declaration principles. And then finally, a few ideas about the way forward. Um, first of all, why focus on aid effectiveness in ARD? First of all, it's a fact that three out of four people in developing countries live in rural areas. They're all poor, and almost all of them depend upon agriculture. It's important because agriculture has been found to be a uniquely effective tool for achieving MDG 1. It's now generally accepted that if you can get growth in agriculture, this is far more effective than growth in other sectors in terms of reducing poverty. So it's really important that we make aid in this sector as effective as possible. Although there's been progress in aid effectiveness in other sectors, this hasn't really been matched in ARD. And there's general agreement that this is something which needs more attention. Part of the problem is that actually gathering evidence of aid effectiveness in ARD is difficult, and this is something I discovered myself when trying to put together this paper. However, the, the challenges of improving aid effectiveness are substantial simply because it's overwhelmingly a private sector activity. Governments can only really play an enabling role, and unlike in health and education, where things are private public sector activities, in agriculture, a lot of the real action is outside the control of government. In addition, the results chain in ARD is complex, and outcomes are intrinsically hard to measure. 
However, this doesn't mean that it's not worth pursuing this. Indeed, one of the key things seems to be that by focusing on aid effectiveness and on results in general, this can be a very effective way of improving development effectiveness in ARD. And so increase the sector's attractiveness for investors and for development partners. So let's look at the first of the Paris Declaration principles, that of ownership. Now, achieving ownership in ARD is difficult because the sector itself is hard to define. It often involves cross-ministerial collaboration, or if in terms of rural development, of course, there may not be any ministry which has a specific mandate for it. In addition, there are inevitable capacity constraints. Leadership in ARD is often missing, simply because it means engaging with the private sector, which dominates decision making, and this is often a very difficult thing for silver, civil servants to do. Um, an example, a positive example, is CADEP, which is labels itself as Africa owned and led. And it shows how a clear regional framework can indeed strengthen country ownership. It has a process of defining country level compacts and investment plans. And this also leads to really marked improvements in the quality of the strategies and plans that are prepared. And even it's beginning to show how real prioritization can be made to happen within these programs. Another interesting factor on ownership is, of course, the appearance of large emerging donors, emerging economies, foundations, and NGOs, which are really big. And they can put country ownership under pressure since they are somewhat less constrained by global agreements about good practice in how to engage with poor country governments. And almost all these resources are off budget and they're so much less subject to scrutiny than normal traditional ODA. The scale of resources from these donors, concessional aid, foreign direct investment and other investments absolutely dwarfs traditional sources. And in addition, it's apparently without strings. So, for example, FDI to agriculture, which was almost 16 billion in 2008, compares with a mere 6 billion for agriculture ODA. Looking at the second of the principles about alignment, uh, donor alignment is often difficult to achieve because of the fact that ARD is multi-sectoral. And so organizing alignment is intrinsically rather difficult. It's also, I'm afraid, often little more than rhetorical. The fact is that where a national program is rather vaguely defined, almost anything can fit. Again, CADIP is a good example because it's played an important role in achieving genuine alignment, mainly because it's established processes for strategy formulation, and investment planning that the development partners endorse. However, of course, some countries really don't want alignment. Uh, Cambodia is an often cited example, and they prefer what might be called an aid maximization approach and playing off one donor against another. All the main development partners have their own strategies for ARD. And it's not always easy to see how these can be immediately aligned with programs in different countries. So the result is that often a development partner will have their own approach or cherry pick the bits of programs that meet their own corporate vision. So how are things changing? There are, what I've detected, are growing concerns amongst development partners about the sort of unreserved alignment behind country programs that has existed for several years. Um, and development partners are keen to intervene through dialogue with governments where ARD is perceived by them not to be sufficiently prioritized in national programs. And so they will try and nudge things in a more positive direction. 
There's also a growing tendency, which is shown in all the statistics, for ODA to target emergencies and other quick fixes. Now, these are necessarily areas in which governments don't necessarily have clear national strategies behind which donors have to align. However, at the end of the day, alignment is, after all, only a means to an end. Uh, and it might often be sacrificed in the interests of development outcomes. The third principle of harmonization. I'm afraid in this area, there seems to have been comparatively little progress in ARD. The sector continues to be dominated by the project modality. And some of the biggest donors, for example, USAID and Japan, are not able to use budget support or other forms of common flow of funds mechanisms. So this limits the amount of harmonization that can really be achieved. It works best at local level, often through agriculture and food security donor working groups. Vietnam is an example where this is a very effective mechanism, even though it's rather ad hoc. Uh, there are lots of other examples, uh, such as Ethiopia and Tanzania, where it works very well. And donor working groups are also important because more and more development partners are decentralizing responsibility for decision making on budget allocations to their country offices. So the local guy in the donor working group can actually be influenced and influence others quite effectively. Financial harmonization hasn't gone far. Swaps in ARD have had mixed results and have largely been abandoned. It seems that program-based approaches seem to be more achievable because they don't have such demand for basket funding, for example. Um, a side example is, again, in connection with, the, with CADIP, the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, where there's a multi-donor trust fund which has been set up by six donors who've put about $60 million into providing technical support for the program. And this is managed collectively. The adoption of common systems by development partners also seems to be very difficult. Each one has its own demands for reporting, m and &E, and so on. And similarly, few have effectively used national systems of budget, financial management, procurement, mainly because they need to conform to headquarters norms, but also because often these systems are rather flawed at the country level, and I have to say, especially so in the agriculture sector. In some cases, there are examples, for example, uh, Honduras and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, but also in Laos and Mozambique, where project implementations continue to survive and are said to have even been a very effective way of achieving successful implementation. I also have mentioned in the paper Myanmar, which is a very special case of where harmonization has been adopted by uh, development partners, mainly because they want to share the risk of doing business there. The fourth principle, managing to development results. Now, this has become, if you like, the gold standard for aid effectiveness aid effectiveness, and it underlines almost everything else. Um, it's not just about harmonization or ownership or alignment. Results is what counts. And results and value for money have become something of a mantra of many development partners. And this increasingly dictates how they operate. There's pressure to be able to predict results even before programs have been implemented so that we know we're going to get a good result and all the proof and evidence is there beforehand. This trend underlines the need for really solid evidence of impact in ARD. And some good examples in Nicaragua and Vietnam, for example, of where a lot of effort has been put into creating strong M&E and management information systems. Also, the communities of practice for aid effectiveness in Africa and Asia have been set up, and these have created a greater awareness of the need to show results. The intrinsic problem of gathering solid evidence of impact 
however, suggests that this could have a, a long-term adverse effect on the financing of the sector. Both development partners and ministries of finance find it a lot e easier to show results and justify allocating money to health and education rather than agriculture. And once the focus on impact on high food prices and initiatives like GASP and AFSI move on, we could well find that ARD is once again witnessing a slump in donor interest. There are all sorts of other halfway measures such as results-based budgeting, which uh, at least help to ensure that resources are used effectively, even if you can't immediately show or demonstrate the results. The fifth and final of the uh, principles, of course, is mutual accountability. This is where governments play a very important pivotal role uh, because they have to be accountable upwards to the people who provide the money from external sources, and they have to be accountable downwards to the voters themselves. Uh, domestic accountability, downwards accountability, is really difficult in ARD because people in rural areas are scattered around they may not have easy contact with decision makers or politicians. And even where there is proper democracy, non-state actors have a hugely important role in serving as legitimate intermediaries between rural people and governments. The establishment of a formal mutual accountability framework uh, has been shown to be really important in, in the Africa program in CADEP. Um, and they've established something at country level which targets engagement with and accountability by farmers, farmers' organizations, civil society, the private sector, parliamentarians, and development partners. And there is capacity building needed at all of these levels. In a slightly modified example, in Rwanda, they've set up, for example, very clear performance indicators which have had a really positive impact on civil servants, for example. If they promise to do something, there's a clear mechanism to show whether it's been done or not. And accountability on the part of development partners, however, in funding for ARD has been really quite difficult to achieve. Aid flow data are often incomplete and development partner figures are often quite different from the figures reported at country level. The L'Aquila Food Security Initiative, AFSI, has been a positive step in this regard because at least here they try to set contributions against commitments and are prepared to report on that. So finally, what are some of the priorities? Um, there are many more than these four, but the ones that I think float to the top are the huge task of capacity development that is required to enhance agriculture and rural development's ability to manage the development results. It needs support in strategy formulation, planning, results-based budgeting, M&E, data, statistics. All of this is needed if it's going to be able to, in fact, demonstrate results, which is so important. Secondly, um, Mutual accountability. Setting up mechanisms of this sort is difficult simply because the sector is dominated by private sector players. And resources need to be applied to institutionalizing the role of non-state actors in a mutual accountability framework. It doesn't happen on its own. Third, country leadership still has to be strengthened through establishing solid consultation mechanisms with rural stakeholders. And this is regardless of where the money comes from, whether it's domestic resources or external resources, you still need to have a clear leadership for the sector. And that's still often not in place. And then finally, emerging donors who play a new and expanding role in the sector must be brought into the aid effectiveness agenda so that their influence does not reverse the progress or hold up the progress that is being made in aid effectiveness in the sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for that very informative and yet brief, punchy 
to the print um, presentation. I'm sure that all that hard work reduced to 15 minutes. That's quite, <laughs> quite an achievement, so thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open the floor to discussion now. So if you have a question for Mike or would like to say something into the round, please press the raise hand button. Um, and then I'll get back to you and we'll start now. Is there anyone who ha wants to kick us off? Hi, this is Monica. Can I go? I haven't raised my hand, actually. Hey, here, yeah. raising my hand. Go ahead, Monica. <laughs> Doing it uh, uh, formally. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Uh, I liked it uh, very much, and I think you've whittled it down to the essentials, and it is very clear. Um, I went first because I want to ask you your opinion on the last point on emerging donors. How likely do you think uh, they will be brought into the aid effectiveness agenda? I think that's a, a big question, and I would be really interested to hear your opinion. Thanks. Thanks, Monica. Yes, this is indeed the billion-dollar question. Um, as with all these things, of course, uh, it comes down to country ownership. Um, I don't think uh, many people have a chance of twisting the arm of China, for example, to, if you like, come clean or to be totally open and transparent in terms of what they're doing. However, the countries that are their partners certainly have the opportunity to say, well, you know, in addition to the conference center and the railway line, we'd also like you to actually, if not put your contributions on budget, then at least to be as transparent as you can be in terms of where things which are directly uh, impacting the agriculture sector, for example, are clearly shown and can be uh, accounted. Uh, it's really a matter of information, and I think no one can, as I say, twist China's arm, but they can, through the governments which are their partners, I think, make a, a fairly reasonable request for the main lines of their uh, aid programs to be uh, more transparent. Thanks, uh, Mike. I have a question from Frank, who's not managing to get through via audio, so I'll just ask that for him now. Um, he'd like to know why the private sector should get involved in mutual accountability. Okay, I think the private sector, I mean, in agriculture at least, the private sector is so important that it, they need to be involved simply from the point of view of being able to dialogue with everyone else about what is being done. Um, if you don't have a seat at the table through mutual accountability, then you don't really have a chance or even perhaps the right to engage with public sector policy makers and planners. So I think it comes with the business. If, if you are an investor, if you're a trader, if you're a, a food processor, and you would like to be able to influence the way public sector strategies and policies are formed, then you need to, as a quid pro quo, actually come in and, and say, well, our, our proposal is to do this particular type of investment. Um, we have, perhaps, and we need to encourage corporate social responsibility even, to say we have a way of doing this which will not exclude small farmers, which will not remove jobs, but perhaps improve them through contact with technology, through uh, employment on farms, through things which can, uh, in fact, spread some of the benefits of some of the new investment which is going on. So I think, again, it's a matter of uh, if you want to play in the development game and you want to be part of the decision-making process about the enabling environment, then you really have an obligation to have some level of accountability. I wouldn't expect the private sector to expose its books to uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, for example, but at least they should increase their, um, their ability and their willingness to be transparent about what their programs really are. Thank you, Mike. Are there any more questions from all our participants?
Uta would like to say something. Go ahead, Uta. Yes, thank you. Um, Michael, in your paper, did you also address the issue or the topic of climate change and biodiversity? Because that is, to my understanding, quite closely linked to agriculture and rural development. If it's not in there, I'm, I'm very sorry and disappointed. Um, of course, it, it's a bit like some other areas. It needs to be mentioned, but it is, of course, central. Um, I think in, in general terms, of course, uh, there's little that one talks about now that should not have a perspective on it from climate change and biodiversity angles. Um, and certainly, uh, accountability is where everyone, whether it's the private sector or the private sector, whether it's public sector planners or farmers or farmers associations, um, everyone has to be aware that they are accountable not just for making a quick buck, but, but for also looking at the consequences and mitigating any adverse impacts that might come from their own decision making. Um, it's an area which I think is certainly worth looking at more in terms of Paris Declaration principles, and I'm sure someone somewhere is doing this. All right. Um, anyone else before we bring this to a steady clue? Yes, Brian. Brian, Brian. is. Uh, can it, Brian? Okay. Yeah, my, I've been putting my hand up, but I'm not sure that you actually see it. But there we go. Just two comments, uh, Mike. Uh, one in, to follow on from Frank's uh, question. Uh, Selina, uh, Frank can hear us, but he can't verbally respond. Is that right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. OK, just on this question of mutual accountability uh, on the private sector, uh, if you like, you know, in agriculture, private sector and mutual accountability is already on the agenda, particularly with regard to land and this so-called land grab uh, issue, uh, where to some extent we are seeing the private sector on the back foot as they try and uh, increase levels of, of both foreign and domestic investment in agriculture uh, with the, the responses particularly led by civil society. Uh, that is is identifying issues that they perhaps are not accountable for for what they are doing. There was a very interesting side discussion uh, at the FAO CFS Community for Food Security about three weeks ago when GATCO, the group uh, working on rice production in Ghana, went through the mechanisms that they've been adopting to have a dialogue with rural uh, villagers, rural people. And, and set up to some extent and, and, and mitigate some of the concerns that have been expressed about mutual mutual accountability. <clears throat> and I think with the the high numbers of civil society attending the Busan High Level Forum, this issue of mutual accountability is, is which was already on the agenda in Accra but did not get a full conclusion. I think we will see uh, a lot more discussion on mutual accountability and it's going to morph into this issue of partnerships and the global partnerships for development effectiveness which will include uh, private sector I think and and and, uh, and civil society. The point I wanted to make to Mike also was on the question of, of MFDR and the, re the results agenda again if you look at the number of side events and mini debates at Busan many of them are focusing on the results and I think we need to continue to reflect exactly how we want to enhance MFDR. I think capacity development is part of it, but I think it's, if you like, one of the low-hanging fruits. I think it's one of the, 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 the standard responses, if I can use that expression. I think we probably need to reflect whether we want to drill down into exactly what we want to see happening in results. Uh, the formulation of, of measurable objectives in agricultural sector and planning. This goes back to the comment you were making about alignment earlier, uh, that if, if governments are not setting clear agricultural priorities, then donors will do what they will do, which is, which is I think, a fair point. Uh, if there are now then some clear objectives, that is going to allow the allocation of resources both by government and donors to be 
more focused, allowing for the monitoring of achievements, the evaluation results, uh, outputs, and impact. So I think we need probably to drill down to what we mean by management. Uh, the, the phrase MFDR has become the rogue phrase, but I think none of us are properly addressing what the MFDR, what the management part of MFDR means. The communities of practice that are working in Asia, Africa, and, and latterly in Latin America, I think are beginning to pull through some of the issues. And I hope post Busan, we're going to get some clarity on what we, we need to do in terms of that management uh, aspect of, of results. Thanks.